Hi, my name is Maria Lloyd with the Your Black World Network, as well as Your Black Women and IDateDaily.com. And tonight I'm having a uh, discussion with my dear friend and colleague, David Miller. Um, David is actually the author of uh, The Green Family Farm, and he's also a really big uh, black literacy advocate. So um, first off, David, how are you? I am fine. How are you doing? I'm well. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. So can you tell us a little bit about your, uh, actually it's a children's book. I failed to mention that in the intro, but it's a children's book. Can you tell us a little bit about um, the Green Family Farm? So I'm going to hold it up real quick so you can see it. Okay. Nice. And so, um, you know, out of my own struggles, I mean, I have three children. My oldest is 20. My youngest is 11. Um, very difficult finding books for my children. Specifically, mm -hmm. You know, looking at um, black books with black people and, and books written and illustrated by African-Americans and even, even other people of color, you find that a lot of times these books don't necessarily get shelf space. If you go to a Barnes and Nobles or some of the other uh, larger box bookstores, you find that oftentimes they may only have one or two books that are written and illustrated by authors of color. So myself and a whole bunch of people across the country, too many people to actually name, have decided that we're going to make a major dent in the literary world in terms of producing quality stories for black children. Like I am, I'm going to publish four children's books this year. Oh, wow. Just this year, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do four, and I've challenged some of my other colleagues, both writers and illustrators, because the numbers are, um, the, the numbers, like, out of, I can't think, I don't have, I don't have the data in front of me, but um, so few black children's books are published every year. And so what, what happens is a lot of times black parents are looking for books, and they can't find those books. We also know that probably in the last 10 years, probably about 30% of black bookstores have gone out of business. Yeah. So when you think about in most major cities, 10 or 15 years ago, there was a black bookstore. So now parents can't even find uh, those books in black bookstores. And so the Green Family Farm is just uh, one of a number of children's books that I've written. And one of the things that I really wanted to do is create um, a book that really talks about a family who decides to open up a business. And so I started doing some research started checking out the net, connected with a brother in Baltimore by the name of Denzel Mitchell. And Denzel is an urban farmer. Mm. A lot of times we may not realize that there's sort of a, a renaissance going on in a lot of urban communities. You got a lot of black and brown men and women who've decided to open up urban farms and gardens in the hood. That's true. I'm so blown away by this brother, he's a country boy, grew up in Oklahoma, living in Baltimore, married, got, you know, got a rack of kids, got like four <laughs> or five kids. And he has turned this, this art of farming into a business. He even has livestock. I mean, at one time he had chickens and goats and, I mean, and living in the neighborhood. Wow. So you see, you see this renaissance occurring in many urban communities where people are saying, I'm going to take that vacant lot that the city is not going to do anything with it. I'm going to figure out what kind of permits and things that I need to get. If I need to partner with the community association and we're going to open up a farm. And so I decided to create the story about the green family. They're living in the Brownsville section of Brooklyn. So they living in, they living in the hood. Right. They realize that they're living in a food desert. They realize that they live in a neighborhood where it's difficult for them to access fresh fruits and vegetables. Right. They can go to the bodega and they can buy Philly blunts. They can buy fake hair, fake nails. They can buy all this, all of this stuff. Right. Hard for them to get bananas, apples, oranges, grapes, fresh, um, fresh, you know, fruits and vegetables. So the story again is about a family of uh, four. Uh, the, the youngest daughter is told through the eyes of the youngest child, a Kosawa who's six. And then her brother, Booker T. Washington Green, hmm. 
So these two kids, along with their two parents, along with their parents, have opened up uh, uh, this wonderful farm in the heart of Brooklyn, selling fruits and vegetables to other stores, to restaurants, and they've created a business to be able to feed their own family, but to also address a much uh, a much difficult need in that community because they're living in a food desert. Wow, I love that. That's so empowering for children, especially to read a story like that, because really it kind of teaches our kids that, you know, you don't have to kind of deal with the cards that you've been dealt. You can actually reshuffle and really you can create your own cards. So um, I really I love that storyline. I think that is so empowering for our youth. And speaking of which, um, as I mentioned in the in the beginning, you are you have a you've done a lot of work or you do a lot of work in literacy, especially as it pertains to black children and literacy. So um, from a historical context, when we talk about illiteracy in black America and the fact that, you know, slaves were banned from uh, learning how to read. Can you kind of address uh, illiteracy in black America from that perspective, like the just a historical context? So, um you know, I, I think it's really important for people to understand that when you think about a lot of the, the, the systems or the structures that were set in place during the enslavement period, a lot of that was created so that um, Africans wouldn't be able to empower themselves. Mm. And being able, to, being able to read, being able to write has always, was, has always been seen as a form of empowerment. And so I think a lot of times, you know, the slave masters realize that if if the folk on my plantation are able to read and write, they're gonna be able to plant, they're gonna be able to pass messages, they're gonna be able to educate themselves, which down the road is gonna equal a level of empowerment, a level of, 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 of freedom. Mm. Oftentimes, you know, I meet young brothers all the time and I'm asking them, what are they what are you reading? Or I'm when I when I talk to black people, I'm always asking them what are they reading? And they tell me, well, I don't be reading. That's how they say, I'll be like, please don't, don't ever say that <laughs> again. You have to read something. Right, right. Magazine. Um, I mean, you know, to, to, to be able to read is just a very powerful concept. Even walking down the street, being able to read street signs or being able to read a map. Um, we, we take literacy for, for granted. And, and when we, when I sort of drill down on the work that I'm doing, a lot of the work that I'm doing is really with um, African American males. Mm. And nationally, only 12 percent of African American males are proficient in reading by eighth grade. Oh. And so when you when you when you do sort of a a state by state scan, even going down to um, you know states like Mississippi, Mississippi only about statewide. Only about 3% of black boys statewide in the entire state of Mississippi, only about 3% of black boys are proficient in reading by eighth grade. And mm. so we know that for the work that I'm doing, getting boys excited about reading is so critically important. One of the, one of the other books that I wrote is called Khalil's Way. It's the story of an 11-year-old boy growing up in a tough neighborhood in New Orleans but Khalil is a math genius. He could, he could take college level math courses and he's only 11 years old. Mm. He's super smart, but he's being picked on because he's so smart. And so a lot of the work in the books and some of the other books that I'm helping some other folks write are really trying to change the narrative about what it means to be black, what it means to be a black child, and what it means to be intelligent. Wow. Thank you so much for your work. I mean, that <laughs> I, I'm so inspired just from what you've shared with me so far. And, um, you know, you're absolutely right about just the importance, the sheer importance of being literate. Um, I mean, I was raised in Mississippi, so I'm very familiar with, you know, that data that you just ran past us. Um, unfortunately, I, I know a lot of people when I was in high school, I know those guys, the black men, particularly in my class who when we were called upon to read aloud, they would find any reason to get in trouble so that they could be dismissed from class. And so um, it, it's really heartbreaking for me because I am such a bookworm. I mean, that's all I do is keep my head down in a book. 
And when I was a child, I actually graduated from fifth grade. Um, I was like the second, I had read the most books in the, in the school, in my class. Um, yeah. So I am, I mean, when I say I'm a bookworm, I am a bookworm. And so it really breaks my heart that so many children, especially black children, aren't as enthusiastic about reading as I used to be growing up because that was my escape. You know, there, I was raised in Mississippi. I, I practically grew up on a farm. So, you know, after I got finished playing with the dogs and chasing the, the chickens and all that stuff, I mean, what else is there to do? I was raised as an only child. So I would literally just become a recluse and, and just totally indulge myself in my books. And the thing that I think was very, uh, rewarding for me as a child and being indulged in reading was that it really helped me spark my creativity. And I see how that helps me in my adulthood. I'm able to articulate and formulate my thoughts uh, in a much clearer way than say my peers who were not interested in books like I was growing up. So I agree with you. I mean, it's, it literally breaks my heart that so few black children are, you know, actively uh, or active readers or really black people. As you mentioned, you know, you ask black people, what are you reading? And they're like, I don't read anything. That is so heartbreaking, you know? So um, thank you so much for your work. And um, I definitely want you to share with our audience um, where they can purchase um, the Green Family um, uh, Farm book. So the easiest way is you can go to our website and it's daretobeking.net, D-A-R-E-T-O-B-E-K-I-N-G.net, daretobeking.net. Okay. Um, now, if people want to contact you, let's say they want to, you know, they want to learn more about your work or bring you to their school district, how can they get in contact with you? So again, the website, daretobeking.net, um, I'm on Twitter. Uh, Facebook, I'm, I'm pretty easy uh, to find. My email address is info, I-N-F-O, at daretobeking.net. Okay. All right, perfect. Well, David, like I said, thank you so much. Your work is so, so important. Um, I'm inspired by this conversation. I really hope that our audience members are as well. And, you know, best wishes to you with your uh, aggressive initiative to, you know, get more black books uh, on the shelves. I will say when I was growing up, I was reading stuff by, you know, Ronald Dahl and, and you know, those types of books. So clearly black people were not represented in those stories. But um, I think what you are doing is, is so necessary. So thank you so much for your work. Well, thanks a lot. Be safe. Okay. Thank you. And you guys, thank you for tuning in. Um, please, if you have any questions for David, um, I definitely recommend that you check out his website. He actually does a lot of work in Ghana as well that's centered around literacy. So this brother is international. He's not just helping Black America. He's actually uh, formed alliances with our brothers and sisters on the motherland as well. So you guys, please support David uh, by this book and support his efforts. And thank you guys so much for tuning in. Have a good night.